Hi, Dr. Biology here, and this video is on classification, and it's in the unit of Inheritance, Variation, and Evolution, and it's for AQA, GCSE, Biology, and Combined Science, and it includes the content you need for both higher and foundation tier. So classification. There are many species on Earth and biologists have developed ways of grouping these together to help identify them, but also to show um, how species are related. And that's quite a difficult task. If you look at the number of different types of groups and families and of different species, you can see that there are many species of um, plants and animals on Earth, particularly the invertebrates. Two thirds of the um, number of species on Earth are invertebrates, and vertebrates only make up 1%, and that includes us as mammals. So how do we classify species? Well, the first classification system um, was discovered by this guy here called Carl Linnaeus, and he was able to group living things together by looking at their structures and characteristics. And he made very careful observations and classified organisms um, based on what we call a hierarchical structure. Now, here is an example of a hierarchical structure. So I'm going to tell you what the hierarchy is, and that is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now that is something you're going to have to learn for your exam. However, you're not going to need to learn the example. This is just an example here for you to look at related to the lion, panthera, leo. A good way of remembering that order, that hierarchy, is to use a mnemonic. So for example, one mnemonic I use as Dr. Biology is the following. So I use the mnemonic king prawn curry or fat greasy sausage. So that reminds me of what the order of the hierarchy is. So in the example, you can see the different uh, kind of um, groups. So kingdom for the for the lion is animalia, phylum chordata, the class is the mammalia, order carnivora, family is felidae, which is the same as your pet cat, and genus is panthera, and then the species is leo. And you can see what those descriptions are showing for each. You'll also notice that it's in Latin. And we're going to talk about why Latin is used as a scientific language in a minute. So here's a couple of examples of classification mnemonics. So my favourite is king prawn curry or fat greasy sausage. But you can come up with your own mnemonic and it's a really great way to remember the hierarchical structures because more than likely you're going to be asked questions on this hierarchy in your exam. So how do you name species? Well, you use what we call a binomial naming, naming system. Um, the same organism can have different common names wherever you go around the world. So my example here is in the UK, we have ladybirds, whereas in the US, they are ladybugs. So we have to give them proper um, scientific names so that, that scientists know that they're talking about uh, different or similar creatures. So every organism has two names. So these are in Latin. Um, the reason they use Latin is that it's an ancient language and um, also the fact that no nation would be offended by giving them these names because Latin is not a specific language used by one country. So here is an example for humans. So humans under the genus is Homo. So our genus is Homo and our species is Sapiens. So Homo sapiens. So genus is like our surname and the species name is like our first name, but it cannot be shared with any other species. The first word genus, it always has a capital letter. And the second word species is always written with a small letter or lowercase letter. 
Now, Latin names are always written in italics, but obviously you can't write in italics. Um, well, you could. You could try, I suppose. Um, but they can be underlined. So here we've got um, three different types of panthera. And you can see the capital letter for genus and lowercase for the species. And that is in italics. Now, the hierarchical system um, was very good, but it was only based on structures and characteristics, and it was quite simplistic. Now, um, new domain systems are being developed all the time, particularly uh, this one by Carl Voos. And Carl Voos was able to base his evidence on um, life related to DNA analysis and sequencing. And he found some very weird and wonderful relationships between species that weren't known by just looking at their characteristics. But he he looked further than kingdom, so higher than kingdom. And he looked at the domains. So domains, the three domains are archaea, which are primitive bacteria, which usually live in extreme environments. So you might remember talking about extremophiles, for example, on volcanic vents under the sea. Bacteria, the true bacteria, and there are many species of bacteria. And then the eukaryota, which includes protists, fungi, plants and animals. And that includes us as homo sapiens as well. A really good way of looking at classification is using an evolutionary tree. So they are methods used by scientists to show how they believe organisms are related. Re well, not believe, but related to evidence, particularly fossil records as well. They do use current classification data for living organisms and fossil data for extinct organisms. So you can see in the diagram here, you can see the common ancestor is at the bottom and then you get ancestral species and then speciation occurring, getting species you can see at the top A, B, C, D, E, F and G. Um, another form of classification is going downwards rather than upwards. But the key points here, so let's have a look at this first classification tree. Species F and G are more closely related than, uh, than to E. The reason being is that they are closer on the um, evolutionary tree. Also, humans, in this second example, humans are more closely related to chimpanzees than with gorillas. So you can see that they're closely related, related to the evolutionary tree. They are, we are related to gorillas, but more distantly. OK, so let's go through some questions. So let's go through a question checkpoint. This first question is for foundation tier. But if you're doing higher tier, I would have a go at this one as well. So as usual, if you've watched any of my videos before, I ask you to read it. I Sorry, I ask you to pause first, read it and answer it. And then I will go through the answer with you. So three, two, one, pause now. So this question gives you a classification of one species of wheat. OK, so they've actually given you the classificate hierarchical order, but they want to know what is the binomial name for the wheat in table one? Well, if you remember back to what I was saying, the binomial name is the genus and the species. So if we look at genus, it's triticum and species is spelter. So it will be triticum spelter. Then uh, this is a bit more of a difficult question, actually. It to, uh, so again, I'd like you to pause, read it and answer in three, two, one. So modern classification systems compare the similarity between the DNA of organisms. So the more similar the DNA code, the more closely the organisms are related. And they show a DNA code in five different organisms. And it says, complete the final column of table two for pig and wheat. So you've got to look for the number of differences in the DNA code compared with the human sequence. So literally, you're looking and seeing, is there any differences? So you can go through and look through the human code and the wheat and pig code, and you'll get two for pig and you will get four for wheat. So the two differences here are um, 
Yep, the first two, so J and F. Whereas in wheat, the four differences are C, I, K and M. Two and four. And then it says which organism in table tier two appears to be most closely related to humans? Well, the one that's most closely related will have the fewest differences in DNA. So in that case, it's going to be the pig. It then says give one reason why conclusions about the similarities between organisms sh should not be made using only the DNA codes. It's a bit more difficult, that one. So you need to think about um, the fact um, that only a small sample of DNA is used, OK? There may be differences if you look at the rest of the DNA. OK, question two. Again, this is uh, foundation tier. So scientists look at structures inside cells to classify living things. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I'd like you to pause it, read it, answer it, and then we'll go through it. So in three, two, one. So the first thing is this is related to your knowledge of cell biology. All right. So it's saying suggest one structure found in cells that can be used to classify living things. So that will be anything like the nucleus that has DNA or mitochondria or ribosomes. So anything with DNA in it or proteins. Um, the table below shows one system for classifying humans. So again, it's a classification system. And then it asks who devised this system? Well, you do know that the hierarchical system was devised by Linnaeus. OK, so I'd like you to pause, read and answer in three, two, one. So the table from before, so this is the same table and it says X is the largest category in this classification. You've got to name category X. Well, that's where my mnemonic will come in handy. So a good way of remembering it. So I say king prawn curry or fat greasy sausage. So K, I remember K is for kingdom. Give the binomial name of humans. Use the information in the table above. Well, you might already know that because I've told you that the genus is Homo and the species is Sapiens. So it will be Homo sapiens. And then it says, suggest one way that classification systems are useful to scientists. Well, they do allow you to look at how related species are. It allows you to monitor biodiversity and it also allows you to identify different species. Spelling mistake there. Species should be spelled S-P-E-C-I-E-S. OK, let's look at a higher tier one. So this is higher tier. Um, I'd like you to pause, read and answer. So in three, two, one. Right. So it says in the 18th century, a binomial system of grouping similar organisms was developed before the binomial system. The common briar rose had the following names and it gives you all of the names, the Latin names. It's quite a mouthful. I'm not going to read them all. And then it says, in the binomial system, the same rose is called Rosa Canina. So one advantage of the binomial system is that the name is shorter than the names used before this system. Then asks you to suggest two other advantages of the binomial system. Now, when you see the keyword suggest, there, there are lots of different answers you could have. So let's have a look. Well, I did tell you that having the, having the same binomial systems means that all scientists around the world will understand what you're talking about. The genus, so genus in this case is the ro is Rosa, gives information on its ancestry uh, related to other Rosas, so other rose plants. And it tells you how related organisms are to each other. B, classification systems have changed in the last 50 years. Give one reason why we now have more information. Well, I talked about Carl Voos and about DNA analysis. So we've um, had um, discovery of DNA. We've also, the other things you could mention are things like improvements in microscopes, so the use of electron microscopes. 
um, to allow us to look at internal structures of organisms and cells. And then it asks you, see, Archaea is one of the groups in the three domain systems. Give two features of the domain Archaea. So this is definitely higher tier. So Archaea, if you remember, I did say it's a primitive bacteria, or you could say they're prokaryotes, and they live in extreme environments. So you could mention that they are extremophiles. OK, so here's the next question. So again, I'd like you to pause, read and answer. So in three, two, one. So again, this is a higher tier question and, you, and it talks about fall armyworms and they are native to America. What you're probably noticing is that they, they give you uh, species that you've never heard of before. Um, and that's not a problem in terms of answering, but you just need to be aware that they will mention species that your teachers have not mentioned. So it says fall armyworms eat corn plants. It tells you the binomial name. And then it says the fall armyworms belong to an order of insects called Lepidoptera. And the table shows a classification table for the fall armyworm. And it asks you to complete the table. So they've given you some information that you're going to use to answer the question. Now, obviously, you're going to need to know the hierarchical structures. You only get two marks for this. Um, so let's go. So the kingdom... Well, the kingdom is going to be Animalia because in the question it tells you that they are animals. OK, so if they eat corn plants and they're um, an insect, so it's Animalia. And then kingdom. So if you remember my mnemonic king prawn curry or fat greasy sausage. So king prawn. So prawn is going to be phylum and then curry is class, which is insector order family. And then so fat, greasy, so genus. So the genus in this case, well, it tells you the binomial name. So it's Spodoptera. And then species is, I'm not even going to pronounce that. So the next question, it says fall armyworms have been found in Africa. So by 2016, they had spread rapidly destroying corn crops. And it asks you to suggest one reason why the fall armyworms are spreading so rapidly in Africa. Now, this is obviously not related to classification. And this is actually a question on um, competition and, and related to um, spreading of um, species in, in places where basically they have few predators, few diseases, a favourable climate or food is available. Um, it then asks you about fall armyworms and not worms. They are caterpillars of moths. Describe one way scientists could tell if a new worm they found should be classified as an annelid or as an arthropod. Well, basically, they need to compare the structures. They could use DNA analysis. So these are all examples of uh, correct answers. Maybe use electron microscopes to compare annelids and arthropods. So let's have a look at a few uh, evolutionary trees. So this first one is foundation tier, but I'd like you to pause, read and answer in three, two, one. So let's look at the um, information. So it shows an evolutionary tree and then it says complete the sentence. So the model shown in diagram one is an evolutionary tree. Which two of the animals in diagram one are most closely related? So remember, you need to look at the branches and those that are closest on the same branch would be the most related. So in this case, it's the hippo and the pig. Diagram two shows a re more recent model. Well, and it shows differences. It shows relationships and the it says suggest one reason why scientists have changed the model of the relationship. Well, it's going to be based on evidence. So whatever evidence the scientists are able to get, that will allow them to look at relationships and how closely related animals or species are. And so in this case, they give you three options and it is new evidence from fossils. Let's look at a higher tier one. So this shows evolutionary tree for the Galapagos finches. So I'd like you to pause it, read and answer in three, two, one. 
So first question, which type of present day finch is least closely related to all the others? So you need to look at which one has no links with any of the other finches. In this case, it would be the vegetarian finch. And then it asks you which branching point P, Q, R or S on the diagram shows the most recent common ancestor of all the tree finches. So you need to look at the tree finches, so small, medium and large. And you need to go down the evolutionary trees until you find they're all related. And in this case, it would be R. So that's the most recent common ancestor. And then which two finches have the most recent common ancestors? So again, you need to look at the time scale and anything that's nearest to the present day. So it's the mangrove and the woodpecker finch at point P. OK, so that does us bring us to uh, the end of classification. OK, so I hope you found it useful. There's going to be um, more videos on different units soon. So this is the end of inheritance variation and evolution. Please do subscribe and put your bell alert reminders on for more videos from Dr. Biology. I'll see you soon.